Hi everyone, my name's Eleanor and I'm the Education Manager at Benjamin Franklin House. Welcome to this week's live history class and um, we're continuing our series all about Georgian Britain and this week we're thinking about Georgian fun and games, so all the things that um, people did in the Georgian period to have fun. So hopefully we'll have lots of fun learning about it too. Um, hello to Enid and Harriet, thank you for joining us. Um, so uh, I'm really looking forward to having lots of participation throughout the class. Now there are two main ways you can do this, either by typing in the chat or by using the raise hand button as well. And then I can unmute your microphone and you can speak over the audio. We're also recording today's class. So if you're watching this later on YouTube, then, um, and you have any questions, you can always send me an email um, to education at benjaminfranklinhouse.org. Hi also to Xavier, Laura, Esther, Elijah, Talitha and Liliana. Thank you so much for joining us today. And as ever, um, I can see lots of familiar names, but there may be some, um, some new um, members of our class joining today. And so we're gonna start by just reminding ourselves um, who Benjamin Franklin was and what he was doing in London. So here we are. Now I know that lots of people have joined previous classes. So um, here's a picture of Benjamin Franklin on the left. Now, since we're thinking about fun and games, I wanted to share this lovely painting of him doing one of his favorite um, kind of pastimes, which was chess. He actually wrote a book all about how um, chess was a very good uh, way to develop um, special skills. So he really enjoyed playing chess. And here's the um, building on Craven Street where he lived for almost 16 years in London. Now, I wonder if anyone joining us would like to share more about what they know about Benjamin Franklin or um, what, what he was doing in London during this period. Hi, Maxi. Hello. So, Benjamin Franklin was one of America's founding fathers and I believe that he was the one who actually helped to stop the UK keeping control of America. Thank you, you're on the right track. So um, he did come to America, he did lots of things. He was a writer, a printer, a scientist, an inventor, and also a politician and diplomat. And that's really what brought him to London in 1757. And he was in this house on Craven Street for um, about 16 years. And during those 16 years, he was trying hard to find a way for um, uh, America to remain part of Britain. But um, as you were suggesting, at the end of those 16 years, it became clear that wasn't going to be possible. So um, when he left, that was when there was the War of Independence and America broke away and became um, an independent country. And he was very involved with that. So he tried to keep England and America together, but then he helped America to become its own independent country. Um, let me see if there are any more raised hands that anyone else wanted to add. Hi, Enid. Hi, um, my little sister says that she knows that she that he invented the lightning rod. Absolutely. Little... Thank you. So is that Harriet? Yes. Oh, thank Harriet you, Harriet. Said that he invented the lightning rod. That's super. You're quite right. That's probably hit the science that he's most famous for, although he did lots of he had lots of different discoveries and inventions with his science. And one more hand up. Hello. What about Benjamin Franklin today? And, was oh, yeah. And um, I also uh, we also watched a video about him, and it said he 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 flew a kite in a in a in a thunderstorm or storm. Yeah, you're quite right, and this was linked to um, his invention of the lightning rod that you know Harriet just mentioned. So he was showing that lightning was a natural form of electricity, and then he invented the lightning rod to protect buildings from lightning strikes. So thanks so much, everyone. You know so much already. But let's get on to this week's topic of fun and games. So uh, as ever, I'm gonna start with a question for you. Um, now, the Georgian period, this is when Benjamin Franklin was in London. It was from about 1714 until 1830. And he was in London from 1757 to 1775. So right in the, 
middle of the Georgian period when several King Georges were, were, were ruling over Britain. Now, my question is, what do you think were some of the main pastimes in Georgian Britain? There is, we're going to find out how some were similar to today, and then there were some that were different too. Hi, Maxie. Hello. So chess is probably one of the main pastimes in the Georgian period, and it has been called, well, the hardest game that has been, ever been made. I think it was invented in India. That's a good point. I actually don't know when or where it was invented, but it was definitely popular. And as you say, it's difficult. And Franklin really liked the kind of strate strategic element of it, um, particularly thinking of him being a, a politician and diplomat. Thanks so much. Um, I can see Enid has a hand raised as well. Hello. Hi. Me and Harriet think that they played with balls. Balls. Balls, yeah. So, um, of course, there's lots of different games that we can play with balls, and we're, go we're going to be we're going to coming back to some that involve them as well. Brilliant. So those are some things. Um, let's go through um, some of the main things that different Georgians, and I'll, I'll ex in previous classes we've spoken about the different classes, the fact that there were the, um, the upper, middle, and lower classes. So as we go through, I'll explain how most classes were doing these things, but maybe in slightly different ways. Great. So let's go through some of the ways that they... Oh, need to raise my hand um that they had fun okay so the first one i wanted to talk about was going to the theater now um at the beginning of the 18th century theaters were mainly just in the big cities but it really kind of took off in in the georgian period and by the end of the 18th century there were a lot more of them many of them were much bigger and more of the kind of towns around the country had theaters too so because in, because in history, a lot of what we do is compare the past to the present. I wonder if you can tell me some of the things, different things that you would go to the theater to see or to do. And then we'll think about whether that's the same as what the Georgians were doing. And also if the experience was the same or how it might have been different. Okay, hello. Hello, um, was it ballet and opera? Right, yes, so ballet, uh, ball, ballet, opera, very good, those are two. Let me go to another hands up. Hello? Um, me and my little sister think that it's because uh, the plays were a lot different than today's plays. Right, so plays is another thing, and some of them uh, are still played today. In fact, on the right of the screen, we can see two actors playing in Macbeth, which is a Shakespeare play that was from before the Georgian period and was played in the Georgian period and still gets played today. So some were the same, real classics that still get played, but you're quite right, some were very different. So thank you. And let me go to Maxie as well. Hello. Hello, I've just got a question. Mm -hmm. Why is David and Pritchard, why are they wearing Georgian clothes since Macbeth was probably set more late medieval times, I would be guessing, late medieval times, 1600, something like that? That's a very good question. I guess it's like today when you have kind of modernised um, stagings of these classic plays, so you have it in a sort of modern scenery, um, even though it was written a long time ago. Such brilliant this page everyone thank you a little bit more about what um georgians did at the theater and what the experience would have been like and then i'll come back to to raised hand so um as i said the 18th century the georgian period was a real time of growth for the theater and um the areas in london that are still today known um known for the theater actually very close to uh, benjamin franklin house so places like covent garden you have jury lane and haymarket those theaters were beginning then um, and so very close to where Benjamin Franklin was living. And we know that he did enjoy going to the theatre. He writes about that in some of his letters. So remembering our, our sources, um, letters are the really important ones. So that's how we know what Benjamin Franklin was getting up to in London. And then we've got these, um, these paintings and illustrations from the time as well. So um, as I said, they were, they were, there were more theatres, they were growing in size, they were, many of them were able to seat several thousand people. Here we have one that's Sadler's Wells. Now, um, there's still a Sadler's Wells theatre. You, um, if you're joining us from, from London or the UK, you may have heard of Sadler's Wells. Today, it's a modern building, 
um, and it's mainly for, for dance. Um, but uh, you've mentioned how people would have gone to see opera and ballet and also plays. Now, um, in the Georgian period, the theatre would also be a place to watch kind of um, almost like circus tricks, things like acrobats and tightrope walking as well. And um, the reason I included this picture of um, these actors in Macbeth is because as well as it being a real century of growth for the theatre in general, it was the century where celebrity actors really became a thing. So um, David Garrick, who's the actor shown here on the right, was a real superstar. And of course, we have lots of um, famous people today um, that sometimes find it very hard to, to, to walk around the streets because everyone wants to, wants to speak with them uh, or have their photo with them. Of course, there were no smartphones then in the Georgian period, but when David Garrick walked around London, he would get lots of his fans wanting to speak with him. And so, so those are things that are similar. Now, something that was quite different about the theatre is the kind of experience as an audience member. So today, when you go to the theatre, um, it's, it's customary to be very quiet when the um, performance is taking place. Um, some theatres don't let you come in if you're late. Um, there are normally snacks and drinks and things, but people try not to make any noise and disturb the other people at the theatre. Now, it was a very different story in the Georgian times. So um, they would be very loud and noisy places. There was lots of eating and drinking. Um, if the audience didn't like what they saw, they might um, make very rude noises or throw things like rotten fruit and vegetables. So it was quite a different atmosphere. And um, it was a mixture of rich and poor people, but they would be in separate sections. So hopefully you can see in this um, illustration from Sadler's Wells from the British Library that um, there are these kind of boxes. So that's where the more wealthy people would, would sit. And part of going to the theatre would be, um, as well as watching the performance, you'd be kind of looking at the other boxes to see the different people from society that were there and what they were wearing and gossiping and things like that. We have the even more special boxes here at the side, and we still have royal boxes at lots of theatres today. And then you have the pit down at the front, that was mostly men, that was quite um, noisy and raucous. And then right up in the galleries, maybe you can just see a very squashed, quite um, dirty and, and loud, and this would be uh, where the cheaper seats were. So you did have a mix of classes, but they'd have their different sections. And so probably have quite different experience as well. And as well as it being quite noisy and full of food and drink, it was more common for people to kind of come in and out during the performance too. So some things that are the same and some things that are different. Um, I'll go now to any raised hands that we have. Hands up now, hello. Hello, um, I want, I got a question. Um, what? Why, what, what play are there? What, what play are they playing in the picture on the left? That's a really good question. I don't think the information about that picture um, actually said what the play was. Um, but if you look this up, the, um, you'll, you'll maybe have noticed at this point, if you've been joining a few of our classes, I use a lot of amazing sources from the British Library. So you can look up 18th century theatre and they have all of these wonderful pictures and things and more information about them. So if you look it up on the British Library website, there might be some more information I wanted to talk about, which um, whereas the theatre, there's still lots of theatre today. Um, the next one is, is quite particular to the Georgian time. So this is pleasure gardens. Now, um, these were lovely kind of ornamental gardens and there'd be lots of different things you could do there. Um, people would go and walk and a bit like at the theatre, part of it would be to kind of see the other people in society, see what they were wearing, the different fashions. Um, we spoke a bit about clothing when we thought about um, in our lesson about the different um, social classes. And, um, but there'd be entertainments, there'd be art on display, so statues, there'd be music playing, um, and people could get food as well. So lots of different things to do. And um, now both these images show Vauxhall pleasure gardens, which um, were probably the most popular. They were very large. So again, if you're joining from London, you know Vauxhalls, you may know that Vauxhalls are an area in South London. And um, at this point, South London, there was not a lot of buildings there. It was still very green. And so um, there were these big gardens. And one of the reasons they were so popular is that it had quite a, um, it was quite a reasonable entrance fee. Um, there were other gardens that were more exclusive and that was partly because you had to pay more to go in. But so once again, although initially designed for the upper classes, the wealthier classes, um, 
in the by the end of the 18th century pleasure gardens were really a place where lots of classes would mix um, but there would be some that would be more exclusive and more expensive so um, you can see everybody going about their, um, their business having fun at the tables um, sit down and then on the right here we have the entertainment so we can see there's some there's some singing going on here um, uh, also in Vauxhall Gardens and um, so actually uh, in 1749 so a bit before Benjamin Franklin arrived in London there was a really big crowd that gathered at Vauxhall Gardens and um, 12,000 people and this was to watch a famous composer from the century Handel who was practicing um, music for um, what he was going to perform at the Royal Fireworks and um, so lots of people went to see that and uh, many other towns across the country would have pleasure gardens too and they would kind of base the designs on these very famous ones in London. So as with other things like the fashions, London was often where um, these things would happen first and then it would maybe spread to other towns and cities and there'd be things that would be copied. So I'll go to raise hands now. Hi there, do you have a question? Hi. Well, I got a question about how many tall buildings did I actually have in the Georgians period? That's a great question. So, um, and it was there were not big tall buildings, no skyscrapers like we have today. And in fact, it links to Benjamin Franklin this question because um, the tallest building in London was St Paul's Cathedral, which was built after the Great Fire of London from the century before. And that's where they put up one of the first of his lightning rods that um, Enid and Harriet were talking, telling us about. So if you if you know how tall St Paul's Cathedral is, that is that was the tallest building. So the buildings really weren't so tall. So next, um, the next uh, place that um, the Georgians would go to have fun and games we're going to talk about was oh a few places. So um, fairs, exhibitions, and curiosities. So we still have um, fun fairs today. And again, thinking about comparing the past with the present, before I tell you about the Georgian fairs, I wonder if anyone can tell us um, what you might expect to find at, at a fun fair. What, what would you go and do at a fun fair? Um, Maxi, hello. Well, one of the things they did is they would look at animals which had come from different places. Like, for example, America had only recently been discovered. Though, however, also, sometimes they'd do really bad stuff. For example, one of the other things they would do is they would, is they would force the disfigured people. So everyone would look at them and go, ooh, ah, oh, all of that stuff. Look yeah. at them horribly. I know, I know. You're quite right. Some really not very nice things. Thank you for raising that. Um, so we'll come back to that because that's kind of the curiosities that I've mentioned here. Um, I'll just go to Karen. Hello. Um, hi. Uh, did they have the um, carousel or the coconut shire? So um, I don't know if they actually had, I don't think they probably had those game, those kind of rides or games yet, but you're, but thank you for telling us um, what, what you might do at a fun fair today. Exactly. So you have lots of lots of rides and games and attractions. So we can see in this, um, uh, in this picture, we have a kind of um, um, one of these circles that goes round and then we have one of these swing seats as well. So things that we might still see at, at the fun fair, um, the Ferris wheel, that's the word, couldn't remember. And then, um, so there were lots of things that they would do at fairs and um, they would travel around. They'd normally be open for about a week. So a bit like today, normally the fun fair would kind of travel around and it wouldn't be open near to you for, for too long. Um, and so some of them would be in relation to traditional kind of uh, festivals, maybe saints days. And some of them would be more to do with um, markets or kind of other celebrations. And um, the, the largest one was in London, and that was Bartholomew Fair. So this is the fair you can see uh, on the bottom left. You can see there are really lots and lots of people. And so this would be held in London every September. And this picture, again, from the British Library, it's the end of the Georgian period, so 1808, around 1808 to 1810. And so you would see lots of kind of, um, someone asked earlier about whether they had the circus. So you'd have those kind of circus trips at the fair. 
Um, and that happens today. So often maybe at the fair and the circus will travel together. Um, but it's become more, more of an established separate um, entity, the circus. So you'd have kind of tumbling and acrobatics, people writing on the, um, walking on the tightrope. Um, Maxie mentioned how you might have exotic animals on display, um, boxers, puppet shows, and um, things like people who are very strong. So we've got lots of things to do at the fair. There will also be lots of booths where um, you would get um, special foods. So things like gingerbread, nuts, sausages, pies, um, a bit like how at fairs today, we might get candy floss or, or um, toffee apples, special treats like that. Um, now, thinking about exhibitions and curiosities, um, there would be exotic animals on display at fairs, um, and I guess some circuses, not so much in Britain anymore, but some um, circuses do use animals still. Um, uh, zoos weren't really established yet, that was a bit later in the 19th century, but all along the Strand, which is um, the road uh, leading from Trafalgar Square, so very close to um, where Benjamin Franklin lived on, on 36 Craven Street, there would be these exhibitions of um, exotic creatures from um, places like Africa. So um, you've got the rhinoceros and you can see it's also called the, like a real unicorn. So they really you can imagine in a time before the television and the internet, people had never, they'd never seen these things. Maybe they'd seen drawings in books. So to see them in real life was, was really thrilling. Um, but these poor animals, they would be on display in small spaces like taverns. Um, when we did the food and drink, we talked about coffee houses. Um, so lots of people around them. And sometimes they'd be alive and sometimes they, they wouldn't. Sometimes they'd be um, so taxidermy. So when you have um, stuffed animals. And actually the Tower of London was somewhere that you would, could go to see animals. So from medieval times, they had a display of um, royal lions. Um, but, and that grew into the Royal Menagerie where they and they added things like ostriches and leopards and monkeys. Um, and from the 1760s, so around the time Benjamin Franklin arrived in London, there was a really growing trade in um, these exotic animals for, for private exhibitions. So um, thinking back to class, those really wealthy upper class families could afford to have their own menageries. And this would be, again, a kind of real sign of their wealth and their status um, if they had their own exhibitions of animals that um, their guests, their friends could come and see. Now, um, I'm going to go to hands up and comments in a moment, but um, Maxie made a very good point that quite an, an unkind um, tradition in the Georgian period, uh, one of the amusements that people would do that uh, we, we wouldn't think would be a good thing these days, is um, that they would go, and, so this word curiosity, so um, as he said, people that were unusual going to see them. So here's an example of a um, Mr. Henry Blacker, who was um, called the, the British giant, he was also called the living colossus. And he was about seven foot four inches tall. So we still consider him to be very tall today. Um, and there were also other, other things, tricks like um, uh, animal performing animals. There was a famous uh, pig called Toby the sapient pig. And it was believed that he could um, read books and spell and um, play cards. But later it emerged that actually his owner was a kind of illusionist. So it made, he made it look like the pig could, but that wasn't actually what was happening. Although pigs are very intelligent animals. OK, so let me go to hands up. Hi, Maxi. Um, this might be a bit of a prediction, but I was wondering, are, you, are we going to have to... Are we going to start looking at museums now, please? Ah, that's really interesting. So museums, again, were, were, were a little bit later. So, um, so there were things like how people had um, exhibitions of exotic animals at their home. There were kind of house museums, so private collections of people who had amazing art. So um, someone in the 18th century, Sir John Soane, whose house you can visit today in London, he had a house museum and, and now it's become a museum that we can all visit. But um, so public museums um, happened, was happening a little bit later. There was um, Hans Sloan who, who would create the British Museum. But, um, but yes, it was starting, it was starting to develop, develop in this period and really took off in, in, the, in the 19th century with, um, with the Victorians, if you think of um, the Victorian Albert Museum and places like that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and um, Xavius, so I'm so sorry I was saying the wrong name. Um, did rich people have exotic animals in their garden? 
Yeah, exactly. So often these very rich people would have very large gardens, what we would think of as big parks. And so, yeah, they would have them there. Exactly. Thanks, everyone. So another one I wanted to talk about was um, sports. So I've got some Georgian sports to show you here, um, which are quite similar to ones we play today, but a little bit different. So I wonder if looking at these, um, these pictures, what they remind you of, what sports they, they make you think of from today. Hi, Maxi. Hello, so I think I can see some shuttle, um, shuttlecock and I can see what looks like bowling. Right, exactly. So, um, so shuttlecock, so, and what, what would we call shuttlecock, shuttlecock now? What's this, what a modern um, sport does that look like? Badminton? Yeah, exactly. So this is a kind of earlier version that was called um, shuttlecock mostly. Thank you. Um, and bowling, you're quite right. Let's see if anyone else wanted to add anything. Hi, Enid. Hi. Um, it looks like there's uh, people bowling, but the bowling, but the bowling pins don't look like today's bowling pins. Right. They look so more like little tiny people, and they're there seems to be more. Yeah, and exactly. I can't remember what these, but they all seem to be wearing dresses, which must be very hard to play that game in dresses. <laughs> Thank you. Um, right, so we, we've we've had bowling, we've had badminton, and we'll talk about what's similar and what's different as well. Which is actually from France, but um, we were played in England as well. And so, like badminton, but with badminton, you have the net. Uh, and with shuttlecock, the aim of the game was just to keep it um, in the air. And we still call the um, uh, what we hit in Babington the shuttlecock. So there's that kind of um, continuity from the old version of the game and the new version of the game. And then here is a kind of um, version of bowling that they, that they did then. It's called nine pins. So um, that's why we have the nine pins. And as Enid mentioned, they look quite different from, from the ones we have today. So um, Curti has said that badminton was made in Badminton House. I didn't know that actually, thank you so much. So, so far we've been talking mainly about um, fun and games for adults, fun and games for, um, for adults to enjoy. So my next question for you is, um, what toys do you think children played with for their fun and games? Okay, so let me go to some raised hands. Hi, Laura. Hi. I know how some children actually played with some dolls. Dolls, definitely. They played with those. Thank you. And Helen in the chat has said wooden toys. Excellent. Um, let me go to Xavier. Hello. Um, I was going to say rocking horse or spinning um, spinning top. Yeah, both of those they would have played with. So there's lots of toys that are still um, that were popular then and are still very popular now. Fantastic. Um, we go to Enid. Hello. Um, I think that they'd probably play with balls and um, maybe uh, like um, like wooden, wooden toys on wheels that have strings attached to them that you can pull around. Yeah, those as well. Brilliant. You've actually got loads more than I've got to show you, but you're quite right. All of those classic toys that are still really popular. Um, I just wanted to share a few with you. So again, very simple thing. So um, here we have a boy with a hoop. So you have a kind of a hoop and a stick and you could hit the hoop along the ground. Um, and that was popular from, from a long time ago and still in the 18th century. And then another one um, in the middle, uh, it's a little bit dark for the picture, um, but this is uh, playing with cup and ball. So these games still exist. And actually in the early um, 19th century, at the end of the Georgian period, um, the writer Jane Austen wrote about having played with, with, a, with a cup and ball. And then dolls, someone mentioned dolls and we also had dolls houses. But interestingly, they were a little bit, they were used in a slightly different way to how they are now. So there are some really amazing dolls houses from the time. Um, this one is um, at one of the a National Trust House. There's also an amazing one at the um, Victoria now, but the V&A Museum of Childhood. 
Now, um, dolls' houses were actually used by slightly older children, um, so kind of teenagers, and it would be a way for women to kind of um, prepare. We spoke, um, we were thinking about class, about how women had to prepare for marriage and to run the household. And so the doll's house would be a kind of way at preparing for that and, and playing at, um, at running a household. So um, some things that were different and some things that, that have stayed the same and toys that are still popular even today. Hi, I have a question. Can we yes. see some of the doll houses? I want to, um, or at least like an inside of a doll house. Yeah, so I've only got this picture in my presentation, but if you look up this Nostel Dolls House, if you, if you write down that name and you go to the National Trust um, website, uh, it, you can see what it looks like inside because it, it really is amazing. Um, it's the kind of copies of the rooms as they would have looked like in the Georgian period. Um, and as I said, there's another amazing one um, on the Victorian Albert Museum. They have a lot, the Museum of Childhood, they have a lot of dolls houses. So if you look up um, Nostel Dolls House. And if you look at the Victorian Albert Museum of Childhood, you'll see some wonderful pictures of um, these old dolls houses. Okay. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, everyone. I've had such great participation today. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my presentation now. Um, a good way to kind of really connect with history is to try and do things a bit like how they did in the past. So as I said, um, cup and ball is still a popular game. But I just wanted to show you if you were interested in how to make a really simple version of your own. So to do this, you just need um, a cup. So I've used a styrofoam cup, but you could use a plastic cup. In fact, you could also use some other recycling, so something like a yogurt pot, as long as it's um, kind of cup shaped. And then what I did is, because um, styrofoam is quite easy to work with, you might need to use scissors if you were doing a different one. Um, I used a sharp pencil and just made a small hole in the bottom of the cup. And then I got some string and tied a knot at one end. Well, threaded it through the hole and then tied a knot so that it would stay there. And then at the other end, I just um, uh, tied another knot. And then round that rot knot, I, um, I folded some tin foil. And tin foil is wonderful. It's a great thing to sculpt with because it just kind of keeps its shape. So it makes a ball. You could also use paper. Uh, if you use paper, you might need to then use some tape as well. And then you've got, you've very simply got your own cup and ball. I'm actually really bad at using a cup and ball, but if you practice, then um, you can maybe try and catch it in the cup. And it's a bit easier if you have the, the string a bit longer, so you can decide how difficult you want to make it. So if you were looking to try your own um, Georgian pastime, then that's a simple way to, um, uh, to make your own cup and ball.